Hi, everyone. Welcome to week eight. We are now officially more than halfway through the semester, and we're really up and running now. As I mentioned in my conversations with many of you, we still have one more paper, and we're also going to start thinking about our final presentations. There's going to be two videos for this week. This first one is the, is the discussion for our reading from last week. I'll also post one that is a walkthrough of the instructions for the final presentations. That one will come on Tuesday. Apologies for the delay if you're waiting for it. But I think it's important that we start thinking about that final project, if not actively working on it. So look out for that video. It's a really important one. And there will be much to talk about following that. Right now, we're focusing on the idea of media as articulated by Marshall McLuhan. It's a really complex and I think fascinating idea, and it's presented by a very fascinating thinker. Marshall McLuhan was not a designer. Marshall McLuhan was a media theorist. And really, Marshall McLuhan was sort of the person who invented the idea of being a media theorist. McLuhan's background was actually in English literature. He was an English professor. And as you may have noticed, especially if you read the excerpt from Understanding Media, he is very well versed in English literature. We saw in that text, if you read it, you might have noticed there were quotes from Shakespeare, uh, Arnold Toynbee, Kenneth Galbraith, uh, Alex de Tocqueville, an extremely wide range of writers, thinkers, David Hume, I, I believe we had some William James, there's a very long list of the thinkers that inspire Marshall McLuhan, and he was certainly no stranger to the written work. But, as you probably noticed, his attention is focused on something else. His attention is focused on the technology at the time, and he was deeply critical of the written word. He saw it as old technology, and he was fascinated by the way our minds and our social behavior are shaped by the new forms of, well, media and technology that we encounter, which leads one to question the role of the written word and literature in our society. On this slide, I have a few of McLuhan's texts listed just for your reference, so you get a sense of the type of writing that, that he, he worked on. His, his real sort of breakout uh, was a text called The Mechanical Bride, and that talked about ways that industrialization shaped humanity. The Gutenberg Galaxy explores the role of the printing press in shaping modern civilization. And then we read from understanding media, the extension of man, the extensions of man. Or if you didn't read from that, the, the other text, the medium is the massage is very closely related to that one. And both are written around the same time period, essentially dealing with the same topics. Understanding media was really the text that made Marshall McLuhan something of a celebrity. He was featured on many talk shows at the time. There's television programs based on his writing. There's actually a, an hour long film of The Medium is the Massage, which is very interesting to check out. You can find it on YouTube. But it's his thinking in that time period, he actually appears in some films in the 60s and 70s as a kind of cameo role because he was a very well-known speaker, professor, and, and thinker. Uh, many people called him sort of half-jokingly the prophet of the digital age. And he had this tendency, you may have noticed, to speak in these pronouncements uh, to state unequivocally what media was doing. And that makes for very interesting and, and compelling reading, I think. He also worked on a few other books that are similar to The Medium is the Massage with Quentin Fiore. War and Peace in the Global Village is another example of a text like that. It's a sort of illustrated graphic theory 
a graphic work of theory. Both of these texts you may have noticed, or at least the one that you checked out, if you read that second one, is really an embodiment of what Laszlo Moholy Naj was talking about in Typo Photo. Remember, there's that great line where he says, uh, in, in the future, philosophy will take shape of the American color magazines of today. And that's exactly what Marshall McLuhan and Quentin Fiore did, I think, in this text. They made a work of philosophy that looks more like a magazine that looks that has these graphic qualities <clears throat> that aligns better with the popular media of the time. I'm going to use that second reading as the as the vehicle to explore these different ideas because they are very much related and I think we can cover both and it's also just more fun to look at the images from that text. So I'd like to unpack some of the ideas, expand upon a little bit of what Marshall McLuhan was talking about and give you the background in some cases where I think it's really necessary to understand. Please also note that I'm gonna pose some questions at the end and, and I'm going to ask you to pose some of your own questions in the, in your, in the discussion portion for this week. So keep an eye out and, and watch alertly, be ready to pose some questions about the information that I share here. So again, the book is called The Medium is the Massage, an Inventory of Effects. This is the second one. I'm gonna to try to not make it too repetitive if you chose this one to read. The first thing I wanted to mention is the subtitle of the book, An Inventory of Effects. This subtitle is really meant as a descriptor for the text. Marshall McLuhan was very well aware of the fact that in the printed word, he was outlining ideas in, in a way that would be processed by the readers in a certain shape and form. By working with Quentin Fiore to create this text, the goal was not to supply information in quite the same way that a written book was. The goal was instead to examine the sort of peripheral influence that those ideas have on you. To understand that every time we interact with media, we see, some, we see the idea that the author is attempting to express. We see one element of the media that's very obvious to us. But the media, but <clears throat> the media also creates a set of sensations that we may not be aware of. So the purpose of this book, the way that it is an effect, is that it creates those sensations. It has an effect on you. It, it sort of washes over you in a way. And it's referenced several times in the text. So this is not a set of information like the book might, like the printed word, like the understanding media, like a chapter from a book might be. This is effects. They come at you in a very sort of haphazard way, we're just marking off all of the influences that a book can have upon you. And understanding those in relationship to the written word is really the goal of this text. And I think it does it quite nicely. And we should also note the, the title is The Medium is the Massage. You may have noticed, again, if you read the other one, at the beginning of Understanding Media, McLuhan states that an operational and practical fact, the medium is the message. This was sort of a catchphrase that he was known for. He, this is at the core of his work. He said that the medium is the message. By that, he means that Every media has a every piece of media has a set of ideas built into it. The idea of the iPhone is what you consume every time you interact with your iPhone. It doesn't matter if you're making a call or sending an email or checking Instagram or TikTok or looking at the news or the weather. All those things are secondary. The medium itself the device that you're using, and I'll get into the definition of media in just a second, the media that you interact with is first and foremost the message that you consume. 
This is central to Marshall McLuhan's thinking. In the title of this book, he's kind of making a pun. He's kind of goofing around. He's making a joke about that, saying that it's the massage. And that idea follows. It does, it's not, he didn't change his mind. It's not one is exclusive from the other. He's also saying that media massages you. It, it sort of influences your entire body. Again, that's the idea of the effect. It, it works you over it. it it's not just about what you see. It's also, you know, on your shoulders and on your arms and on your legs. That was what media does. So first and foremost, the takeaway from Marshall McLuhan should be that the medium is the message. And then second to that, this idea of the massage is kind of a play on that. And with those concepts, this is on the second page of the book now, he states that media wreck the societies in which they occur. They demolish a powerful media, powerful medium will completely obliterate the structure of the society in which it emerges. He believes that the printing press did this. He believed that television did that in the 1950s. If McLuhan had lived to see the digital age that we're in now to see the real influence of the internet and to see what portable handheld devices could do today. I think he would say the same thing that these devices have torn apart the traditional social fabric that had established itself. And then it goes through these pages that this list of changes, I think, is really fascinating. The ways in which society has been wrecked or changed. Everything is changing. You, your family, your neighborhood, your education, your job, your government, your relationship to others, and they're changing dramatically. Think about all the ways in which those relationships, right, your family structure, your interaction with your neighbors, your school, <laughs> here's a spoiler, your education has changed dramatically because of technology and media as evidenced by the fact that you're watching this on a video in your own time and we have not been in the same classroom once. All these changes have completely upended what an education might have been 20 years ago. And the same is true for all aspects of life, according to McLuhan. And he asks, how shall the new environment be programmed now, now that we have become so involved? That part is maybe interesting to consider relative to digital media. Have we become more involved with one another or have we become detached? How is the environment program now that all of us have become the unwitting workforce for social change? It's not that media itself does all these things. It does, but you are also doing them. You are wrecking society, or at least the form of society that previ previously existed and creating a new society by the ways that you interact with media. How are you doing that? What is the, uh, what is the change that you, are in, that you are inputting into society that is coming through your interactions with media? Your family. Again, think about all those mediated exchanges when you're on, when you reach out via a phone or a text or whatever, has that changed your social structure? Has FaceTiming with distant relatives or with relative, close relatives far away, change your interactions. Your job. This is an important point. Jobs represent a relatively recent pattern of work. People didn't have jobs before the industrial era. That's also an effect of media. Before that, people subsisted, maybe they farmed, maybe they were born into a certain socioeconomic role, but it is through technology, through media, in which jobs were invented. So if the nature of work is changing in the digital age, it's only logical. It only makes sense that new media would represent a completely different 
approach to work, to jobs. So how are jobs changing? How is the digital age influencing your pattern of work? And what can we all expect as designers moving forward? And your government has changed. A new form of politics is emerging and in ways we haven't yet noticed. We are starting to notice some of that. We're starting to notice the influence of social media on the electoral process and on public opinion. So we're starting to see them, but, and maybe it's not the living room anymore. Maybe it's the Twitter feed that you look at on the train that you look at in a park that bombards you everywhere. But politics have changed because of the media at our disposal and they continue to change. Again, going back to the title, the, this, the spread that follows this page, I think is one of the most fascinating and most important pieces of this entire book. It's also worth noting that this is coming from a book. You're reading a PDF, maybe you're looking at it on a screen and you're, the effect that it has on you is probably not quite the same as the effect of having a book in your hand. It's a very small book actually. And you can usually find a copy at the Strand for like $6. If you ever come across a copy of this book, I highly recommend it. It's, it's one of the best things you can have for your design education. And the impact of this coming uh, few pages, I think is really critical. So that's just a side note. The statement here, all media work us over completely, I think is really important. They change our psyche they influence our understanding of the world. And that goes for all different sorts of media that we interact with. Each new media and within the room that you are currently sitting in, there are dozens of forms of media. The room itself might be a form of media. All these things create an experience. They shape your life. They influence your mindset, they determine who you are, they work you over completely. This is the idea. And it comes from this following notion that all media are extensions of some human faculty. McLuhan's definition of media is in the title of the other work, the other book from which the chapters were pulled. It's called Understanding Media, the extensions of man. He means humanity. It's an outdated way of saying that. But the definition of media that Marshall McLuhan offers is all extensions of humanity. Everything that we do to extend our person, our experience, ourselves outside of ourselves is media, right? We might think about the news media, or we might think about media devices, social media. All those are very obvious examples. I put a post onto Instagram, or I, I comment on something on Facebook. I'm extending my thoughts out into the world so that others can consume them at a distant location or at a future point in time. The same is true for books as media. I can put words down onto paper so that people far off or people in the future can access them. I'm extending my thought process beyond my normal reach. Anything beyond just me shouting into, uh, into space is a form of media. Obviously, this microphone extends my voice to the processor on the computer, which extends my image and my voice to the internet and then reaches your ears in some distant location from which you would never hear me without all these different media devices. Again, as stated in the other, in, in understanding media, a light bulb is a form of media. It extends your vision beyond the normal human capacity. If this room were not illuminated by artificial light right now, you wouldn't be able to see me. 
so again, the definition of media is vast for Marshall McLuhan. He doesn't just mean social media. He doesn't just mean the news. He means all technology, all devices that extend ourselves, that extend humanity outward. It can be very simple. A megaphone is a way to extend my voice beyond my normal human capacity. That is media, according to this definition. And as we flip through this book, if you're if, if you open it up in this way that you know you have it in front of you, you see this disgusting picture of a foot. I'm sorry, I'm one of those people. I don't want to see feet. Okay, and it actually extends across a few pages, and then mysteriously you come across this image of a big toe that says the wheel, and then it goes on to tell you is an extension of the foot. Cars are media according to Marshall McLuhan. The same as, you know, the railway is media, a horse and carriage is maybe the horse, not so much as the carriage, a skateboard. These are all media according to Marshall McLuhan because they extend our human capacity to walk. The book, and this is a really interesting spread because as you hold this, your fingers on the book, you realize that you're interacting with media, right? It's something that's very much lost on the PDF, but this idea that we hold the book and we're interacting with the book, I think is very fun. And it's a, it's a kind of quirky way to consume this idea. But the book is an extension of the eye. Everything that you would normally see in your lived experience can be recorded and saved for later and transferred to different places. Clothing is an extension of the skin. The shirt that I'm wearing is offering something that my skin cannot do on its own. Therefore, we could see clothing as media. Our sneakers and our jeans are all a form of media. Not only do they extend our bodily function, but they also say something, right? We also notice that there's a message being sent partially by the very nature of clothing itself, but also we should think about ways in which the clothes that we choose also send a message. And finally, in this uh, continuum, electric circuitry is an extension of the central nervous system. This one I think is really important. First, it begins with just simple wiring that, that allow access to all different sense perceptions. But the idea of the internet, something that occurs after Marshall McLuhan is, is writing these ideas, it really it was in existence during his lifetime, but it came, became the social phenomenon that it is after he passed away. We've taken our thought process, we've taken our brains, we've essentially grafted them into the outside world. Social media serves as a, as a sort of thought bubble that's always happening. We can put every idea that we have, every sentiment out into the world where they circulate and commingle with the ideas of others. I think this is a very powerful concept, really uh, central to McLuhan's thinking the human mind now spreads out collectively all over the entire world. Some of these spreads are also just creating new effects, right? This is a found image. There's no new content from Marshall McLuhan. And I think that an important, there's obviously text on this page that's important, but seeing the repetition of words to make the point about printing, to see this kind of Xeroxed copy of, uh, of a medieval text creates the effect more than it sort of sends a written message. Or the idea of using these kind of tricks where you have to read this in a mirror to see, see the text written backwards. It points to the effect that the printed media of the book have on you as you're reading. Another important point that electric communication, at the high speeds of electric communication, 
purely visual means of apprehending the world are no longer possible. They are just too slow to be relevant or effective. The electric communication that McLuhan's thinking about is mostly television. I think our communication is moving even faster. I think that our means of apprehending the world have certainly changed. We see a lot of audiovisual content and perhaps that will change in, in the future. There's again, a sort of all over experience that is no longer just looking in the ways that you would interact with a book, for example. This is a spread that I wanted to point out because one, it contains a, a critical idea that Marshall McLuhan is also known for pioneering. The medium is the message is that first one. The idea of a global village is another idea that has stuck from Marshall McLuhan's thinking. If you've heard that phrase before, if you think about all of us being sort of unified, that notion of the global village comes from Marshall McLuhan. And it's stated in, in many of his texts. This one illustrates that concept with a picture that had originally appeared in National Geographic magazine. I think it's a very problematic image. Uh, the idea of the global village expressed here has an element of what uh, some philosophers and theorists have called the noble savage, this idea that uh, some people who live in illiterate or semi-literate societies are somehow both below modern Western thinkers and also have some kind of innate beauty that cannot be copied in, in modern society. It's an old idea that is obviously problematic for many reasons. It's not stated overtly, but I think that we should consider the sort of intention. And I don't think that Marshall McLuhan and Quentin Fiore were outwardly racist. I think they were the opposite, but I think that they're working on some assumptions. And I think that uh, they might be a little blind to some of the ideas that can be expressed here. And, it's an image that maybe we should pause on it and consider the implications of. So I just wanted to point that out. And you'll notice I'm kind of showing important images, but also skipping some. The way that we draw, the way that we picture the world is also influenced by certain technologies. We think that simple one point perspective, naturalistic renderings are true to the world, but those are also informed by certain technologies. And this is sort of a playful way of showing that. The circuited city of the future will not be the huge hunk of concentrated real estate created by the railway. It will take on a totally new meaning under conditions of very rapid movement. New York wasn't created by the railway so much as it was created by shipping routes from, from sea travel. But we have to question what what will change in the future? We already live in a state where, uh, in, in a condition where we can telecommute, we can, we can interact on Zoom. I know many people who have jobs in the city and now live very far away. This is already changing because of media. What will the future look like in this respect? This idea also that we look at the present through a rear view mirror, we move so fast that we can't even keep up, I think is a fascinating one that follows from this notion of the high speed transit that alters our cities. This one I think is worth noting, especially right now when we live in this world that is experiencing war. And it's not just Russia and Ukraine, that's the one that's on the news right now, but we know that there's war in many places around the world. Conflict seems to be a piece of modern society. Weaponry, according to Marshall McLuhan, is media. The a gun extends your fist, right? And, Marshall McLuhan is mostly optimistic about media. 
other English literature professors in the 1960s were attempting to turn their, away, their students away from the new media. Marshall McLuhan embraced the changes that were happening in society, and he saw a bright future for media. However, the weaponry and violence that can come from particular media was not part of that bright future that he imagined. And it is mostly old technology. So why do we do this work with our media? Why do we keep using these devices in the way that we do? Can new media ever do that? Or can we force new media to do something completely different, to break away from those patterns? And the final spread from the book that I will leave you with uh, states, it is a matter of the greatest urgency that our educational institutions realize that we now have civil war among these environments created by media other than the printed word. Remember, this is also published in 1967 using the ideas that Marshall McLuhan had been talking about in 1964 and I don't know a statement that more accurately portrays the condition of education today better than this one. Our educational institutions largely depend on old media. I give you PDFs, but they're all essentially photocopied from books. Why are we looking at stacks of books when we live in this multimedia environment? Why do we go back to the printed word? Why are we looking at all of this 15th century technology when we live in the 21st century? Is it possible to have an education system that's completely altered by media? And can we still take away the same things? Or will the media change our mindset towards education? I think these are all important questions to consider, important questions to think about. I'd also like you to think about some of the ways in which this text relates to the other content that we've been looking at in class. Do McLuhan's ideas align with some of the previous texts that we've read? I'm thinking particularly about Ella Zitsky, Laszlo Moholy Naj, but also what about F.T. Marinetti or Carl Gerstner or Joseph Mueller Brockman? Um, some of them, those, those last couple, were actually contemporaries of, of uh, McLuhan, though uh, in another continent. What's the conversation that they would have? Would Marinetti agree with McLuhan or would they argue it out? Uh, how, I, I gave you a hint about Maholi Naj, but what about Lizitsky? Is the thinking about new media on par with what Lizitsky saying in our book? Also, do you agree with Marshall McLuhan? Are we always responding to media or can designers, can anyone sort of work outside of it? If the message is the medium, does that mean that the message of all your work is contingent on the media that you employ? And if that's the case, what are you actually saying? What is the role of the designer if we accept that the media that we use is always the message. What can you add to it? What can you say as a designer if you're just using someone else's media? And how has the role of media in our world changed in the past 50 or 60 years? Has our culture changed because of the media? Do you think that we're in a fundamentally different place because of all the new media? Or are we still kind of adjusting to it? Then what does a proper media education, going back to the previous slide, what does that look like today? How do we really account for living in this new media environment? These are a few questions that I'd like you to consider and to respond to. I'd also like to hear your questions. I think that it's a very sort of challenging reading and I'm looking forward to your thoughts on the text and on this presentation. One last thing before I go, I wanted to just quickly mention, uh, this was brought up in the individual meetings and thank you for, for raising the point. 
I'll give you a little preview of, of next week's reading. And I hope that this will be a helpful thing. I'll start doing this in all the presentations, just to give you a little framework for, for what we're reading next week. It's one essay entitled The Whites of Their Eyes, Racist Ideologies and the Media, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> so as you read this, there's some, there's some terminology right off the bat in the title of the work that you should be looking out for because the author, Stuart Hall, is using these terms in a very specific way. The first is racism and an understanding of the sort of social role of racism. The article is from 1981, but I think it's very true today, what you will read. Um, think about Hall's understanding of media. He's not using that term in quite the same way that Marshall McLuhan was. I think it's more limited to popular cultural media, but pay attention to the way in which he's using that. And then also this notion of ideology. What role does ideology play in a very broad sense? You should also think about the linguistic elements that he's talking about. There is a relationship. Stuart Hall is a cultural theorist, but there's a relationship to linguistics here that you should be aware of. Consider whether or not Hall's ideas may have changed in the 30, 40 years since he wrote this article. Has media representation improved? And if so, by how much? The response to this one's gonna be a little bit different as well. You'll attach three images of recent advertisements in which race, plays or ethnicity. It can also be ethnicity. It can also be gender. You can keep it a little more open if you want to think about, in a broader sense, representation in media. But post three images that relate to representation that, that sort of represents different people where you believe the advertiser was consciously considering the question of representation in those ads. Also give brief descriptions of those. Maybe I'll post a couple. I have a sort of whole, uh, I'll certainly talk about them next week. I have, I have a whole uh, collection of images in which I think uh, race, gender, identity play a role. And also note that Stuart Hall talks about the difference between overt and inferential racism. And I think that also applies to representation of gender of sexual identity and so forth. So try to find some, some images in which advertisement, advertisements play off of identity in an inferential kind of way. The post is up for that, look out for it. I hope you've enjoyed and looking forward to the comments that you leave for this week. Thanks.